Grab your Bible and go with me this morning to the 63rd Psalm. Will you do that? Psalm 63. And I want to spend just a minute uh, speaking to you on the subject of what to do when you're in the desert. What to do when you are in the desert. Psalm 63, the heading in my Bible says, My soul thirsts for you. And just below it, it says, A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah, or in the desert, the Judean desert of Judah. He writes this song. Hear the word of the Lord. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. May we pray together. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, we are thankful for this sacred moment to gather with your people in the wonderful, wonderful location here on Mobile Highway, the expression of your church called Klondike. Thank you, Lord, for these moments to worship and to pray and to repent and to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We thank you for the cross of Christ that unifies us and brings us together today. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures that give us food for our souls, manna for the journey. Lord, as you directed me to this psalm, For a purpose. It might be for one or two or five or ten or fifty or all of us. But I know that this is the living Word of God and it is fresh bread for our souls. I also know that many of us today find ourselves metaphorically in a desert. We find ourselves in difficult situations, maybe weariness, maybe exhaustion, or we're tired. We have more questions than answers. Lord, take this psalm today and feed our souls. Lift us up. Lift up our countenance as we're reminded that you are God and you are with us even in the deserts of life. Save the sinner that's nearest hell and revive your church, we pray. In Christ's name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Someone said that the worst in David's life brought out his best. In our text, we find David in the worst possible place he could be geographically for survival. He is in the Judean desert. As you read through your Bible, there are primarily two times that you find David out in the desert. As a young man, King Saul found himself in a jealous rage over David and his relationship with his son Jonathan. He certainly felt threatened by David. And so he 
pursued David to take his life. David leaves Jerusalem and he heads to the east. And whether you're going east or south out of Jerusalem, you're heading into desert land. If you're heading back to the west, of course, it's the Mediterranean Sea. To the north is the Galilee. But David heads out into the desert area and he finds himself in the area of En Gedi hiding in a cave. The scripture records that Saul, uh, pursuing him, actually steps into the very cave that David is hiding to relieve himself. And in that moment, David had a question or a moment of his character. Now, there were many times that David failed in his life. Don't you appreciate the rawness and the clarity of the scriptures that even the heroes of the faith, people that we read about and we look up to, uh, they had many great moments, but they also had messy moments. They had moments where they uh, did not live up to uh, their faith and the call of God upon their life. David certainly had those, but in this moment, a moment of character, he does not touch God's anointed king when he could have taken his life. And it's certainly, 1 Samuel 24, one of the high moments of David's life in his uh, biblical narrative. The second time that David finds himself in the desert is the moment that he writes Psalm 63. This time, it certainly appears to be an even worse moment in his life. His own son, Absalom, had turned against him. Certainly, there are fewer things that would be worse than your own son, whom you have loved and nurtured and fed and reared and clothed, now actually turning on you and attempting to remove you as the king. If you read 2 Samuel chapter 15 and 16, you find the narrative there that Absalom stood at the gate of the city for about four years, and he was trying to gather up all of the disgruntled taxpayers. Uh, Anyone who had a complaint or an issue with Uh, With his dad, no doubt he would get his iPhone out and he would list them in Google Docs. That's supposed to be a little humorous there. He was beginning to make his posse, if you will. He's developing his militia to go against his own dad. Dad has to go as the king. You can imagine the moment for David when he gets wind of this and the pressure that he's feeling in his life. Imagine for you as a parent when you find out that your your son has disowned you, wants nothing to do with you, is even willing to take your life and wants your position as the king. We get a little glimpse into David's emotion in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 14. David turns and says to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, Let us flee or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city, the city of Jerusalem, with the edge of the sword. Now, can you imagine the diversified emotions that David must be feeling in this moment? Anger. Fear, heartbreak, disappointment, and certainly the uncertainty about the future and where he would go, where he would take his family, where he would take his mighty men and his followers to escape his own son. I I want you to feel the emotion and the tension of the moment in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 through 26. David said to his chief of staff, Atei, go then, pass on. So Atei the Gittite passed on with all his men, notice, and all the little ones who were with him. And all the land wept aloud as the people passed by. And the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed onward toward the desert, toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok, 
came also with all the Levites, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they sat down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. And then the king said to Zadok, you carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am, let him do to me what seems good to him. Now, I don't know about you, but those verses touch my heart. Here's a man fleeing for his life. Here's a man with children all around him that he is responsible for, people that he is leading. His own son is after him. And he says, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to put it back in the city. Because here's the reality. It may seem like in this moment that I've lost control and I'm not truly ruling and reigning in the land, it may seem like that Absalom has got the upper hand. But here's the reality. No matter what situation, no matter what geography you find yourself in, our God is always in control. And David said, if God wants me to come back, no, we're not going to take the ark with us. You put it back. And if God wants me to come back, he'll, he'll bring me back. My life is in his hand. I'm not going to read it for you, but if you keep on in the chapter, you see David walking out of Jerusalem, and he is walking up the Mount of Olives, heading toward that Judean desert. The Scripture says that he is barefooted, that his head is covered, that he is weeping, it's a heavy moment. Here's the king. He, he's, he's broken, but he knows in his heart that God is in control. He walks through the Judean desert, and in 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 14, it says the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan River, and there, they refreshed, there he refreshed himself, and no doubt, when you walk through the desert and you get to some fresh running water, it certainly was a refreshment to them physically, but it goes much deeper than that. The refreshing comes from God's provision and God's care and God's guidance. Now hear me this morning, Klondike Church, I think probably there's at least one or two or five or ten of us in the room today that maybe find ourselves feeling like David at the Jordan River. You're tired. You're weary. You've got a story. You've had some stuff in your life over the last few days and weeks and months. We all certainly find ourselves today in a moment of uncertainty. I hear a lot of people saying these days, well, what's going to happen? What's going to take place? We all know there's a national election just a couple of days away. And, and, the, and the future seems to be uncertain. Where are we going from here in this very, very chaotic world? Sometimes you find yourself in the situation you're in not because of the choices and decisions that you have made, but because of the choices and decisions of others. If you find yourself in a desert today because of your own choices, I would certainly say to you that today is a very good day to repent. Today's a very good day to change your ways and to change the direction of your life. But, but in this moment, David is out in the desert completely out of control because of the choices of Absalom. Can you feel the context of Psalm 63 today in your life? I love what Murdoch Campbell said. He said there's basically three types of people in the church. There are those who are Christian in name only. They seem to be following Jesus, but it's a false following, much like the five foolish virgins in the Gospels. Secondly, there are those who follow Jesus, but they do it from a distance, kind of like Peter did. 
when he or when Jesus was arrested there and taken to Caiaphas' house. But he said, thirdly, there, there is a group of people that whether you're in a storm or you're in the sunshine or even you find yourself in a desert, you cleave to God and you know how much you need him and how vital communion with him is in your life. Let's jump in the text, can we? The text shows us what to do when we're in the desert. The first thing we see is that we need to remember that God has not abandoned you. If you feel like you're in the desert this morning, God has not abandon you. David stops in verse number one and says, oh God, you are my God. I love what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. He said, there was no date, there was no desert in David's heart, even though there was desert all around him. He knew that God was with him. David runs to the promised presence of God in his covenantal relationship with him. David knew that no matter where you're at, if you're in the brook of Kidron watching people pass by, or you're out in the desert all by yourself, David knew that every step of the way, God was with him. He spelled it out even clear, I believe, in Psalm 139 and verse number 7. As he asked the question, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. In the Judean desert... God is there. Now, how many of you know it would be very easy in this moment, instead of saying, God, you are my God, it would be easy to say, God, where are you? God, why have you allowed this to happen? God, my son, is rebelling. Why aren't you responding? Why aren't you doing something? But that's not what David cries out. He cries out, God, you are my God. In other words, God, in this moment, I am trusting you no matter what. Anybody this morning in the room felt lately or maybe this morning that you're just hanging on? You're just hanging on? you got some stuff going on in your family, your kids, your grandkids, your job, and you feel overwhelmed. Can you be blessed by David this morning? I doubt seriously, maybe there's someone, but I doubt seriously anyone in the room this morning has a, a son that is trying to kill you today. That wants to wipe you off the earth. But even in this moment, David is able to say, you are my God. Can you feel that personal relationship that David had with his God? And child of God, I remind you that your God has not abandoned you. He is very close. He's very close. You may feel heartbroken. God is near. You may feel betrayed. God is is near. Somebody in the room this morning needs to hear this. Just because you're in the desert, it doesn't mean you've been deserted. Just because you're in the desert, it does not mean that God has deserted you. So when you're in the desert, you need to remind yourself that God has not abandoned you. Number two, we see that we can still seek intimacy with our God. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Now, in some of the translations, it actually says early. And the Hebrew word there could be translated early or earnestly. They both fit very perfectly. How many of you know that every day, the best thing you can do as soon as you open your eyes 
is to commune with your God. Early, early run to him. But also earnestly run to him. Now remember, God is with you. God's presence is is with you. But that does not mean that you and I are acknowledging his presence and earnestly seeking him with our full attention. David is earnestly seeking God. The scripture says, God, I'm thirsty for you. He's craving intimacy with God. What do you crave in the desert? You crave water, right? I mean, you, you get the picture in your mind. He's, he's thirsty for God. Hear me, when you, Christian, are born again by the grace of God, there is a change that takes place in your life. And let me go a step further and say, no change, no conversion. No change, no conversion. It doesn't matter how many times you pray a prayer or get baptized in a church or how many churches you join. If you have no true change in your life, there's no true conversion. Your Bible says if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. When you are changed by the grace of God, God changes your desires. The things that you crave. The other night I was teaching our high school boys at the church and they were all sitting in front of me and I was, I was talking about this change because I have this burden for kids that grow up in the church and they say a prayer and they get dunked and by the time they're 21 they have no appetite for God. That was a weak amen right there. We need to preach a clear gospel. We need to make sure our children know what it means to follow Christ. We need to help them understand what conversion truly is. And so I said to them, guys, listen to me. What what changed in your life? And immediately one of them said, my desires changed. Boy, I love that. I just perked up on that. I said, tell me about that. Well, now I desire to get my phone and read some scripture. Now I desire to, to talk about the Lord. And one of the desires that God places in us is to have fellowship with him in the mountaintop experiences in the valleys. When we're going through stuff, we don't run from God, we run to God. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, If we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. In other words, he will place the right desires in us. And at the top of that list is that we desire him more than anything. When everything around us is shattered and broken and divided and in chaos, we can be thirsty for God. Thirsty for God. Misty and I have had the privilege of being out in the Judean desert a few times. And I can tell you right now, I don't want to be stranded out there. Because if you look east, all you see is the Dead Sea, especially Jerusalem and south. All you see is the Dead Sea, which is ten times the salinization of a normal ocean. And there's certainly nothing refreshing about drinking water out of the Dead Sea. One time I was, in, I was in Israel, and we had the privilege, Misty and I, we were with Vodi Bakum, and, and he was our teacher on the tour, and we got to go to a place that it's the only time we've ever been to this particular spot, but up in the northern part of the desert, I mean, I'm talking dirt like powder, rocks everywhere, just, I mean, a, a wilderness of a place. Right in the middle of that, you walk down the side of the hill, And you will find gushing fresh water in the desert. I mean, one of those kind of moments where I just wanted to jump. I not only wanted to drink, I wanted to jump in. I mean, that water coming off Mount Hermon as the snow is melting and coming down through the Jordan River. And over here is just a spring in the desert. There's water nowhere in sight, but here's a spring. Many scholars believe that this is probably the spot where David wrote Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you, O God. 
We know what it means to be thirsty in our physical body. And David said, I'm thirsty, but my thirst is for God. His flesh, look in your Bible, his flesh is fainting. Oh, this spoke to me, pastors. I was doing a word study on that word faints there. That word means that I am expressionless, almost I am motionless. That's how exhausted, that's how tired I am. That's how wrung out I am emotionally. And David says in this moment, I feel that in my flesh, but my soul is craving for you, O oh God. Christian, I want to ask you today, are you truly seeking intimacy with God? Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for the things of this world? Or are you thirsty for your God? And if you find yourself in the desert today, God is there. And he wants you to turn your attention from your problems to him and to seek him with all your heart. What else do we do in the desert? I love this. I love this. This is my favorite point. If you haven't listened so far, start right now, okay? What else do we do in the desert? We can worship in our weariness. Oh, I love this. We can worship. We can worship when our eyes are flooding. We can worship when our hearts are broken. David, in verse 2 and following, just begins to have a worship service in the wilderness. Oh, I love this. Remember, what did David do? David left the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. We know from the Old Testament, tent, tabernacle, eventually a temple, the place of the presence of God, the place of holy worship. David left that in Jerusalem and longs to go back there. But that does not stop him in this moment from having his own personal worship service. And I would just add to you today, you don't have to be sitting in this room to have a worship service. How many of you have a worship service riding down the road listening to scripture or music? Yeah. You can worship anywhere. David knew how important the manifest presence of God. And David had experienced a regular connection with God. Now, David does not have the location, but he is still worshiping. Verse 2, I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I've never understood why that makes Baptist people so nervous. Because lifting up your hands in the Scripture is just a symbol of desperation for God. God, I need you. I worship you. I give you glory. David just breaks out in a worship service. Here's the reason why. Because he already had regular moments of worship in his life. Someone said it's our regular worship that prepares us for the crisis experiences of life. Regular worship prepares you for the desert. We're not talking about 9-11 kind of worship. Some of the young people here don't even remember that day, but those of us who are 23, older than 23, we remember 9-11. You remember what happened, don't you? Man, everybody was praying. Everybody was gathering. We had a crisis on our hands. I mean, we were filling up stadiums and churches Yankee Stadium was full as people sang, God bless America, and began to pray for God's help. We had a mess on our hands. And certainly when you've got a mess on your hands, the place to go is to God. But unfortunately, that didn't last, did it? In just a few days, we went back to business as usual. So, so here David is not just having a worship service because he has a mess on his hands. He has a worship service in the desert because he knows how desperately he needs God in his life. I love what Warren Wearsby said. 
He said in an hour when David might have been discouraged, he was excited about God. In a place where there was no sanctuary, there was no priestly ministry, David reached out by faith and he found new strength in God. Why? Verse number three, because he had a covenantal relationship with God. That phrase, his steadfast love, reminded him of his covenantal relationship with God. Christian, hear me today. God loves you in the desert. God loves you. He's not forgotten about you. He's not abandoned you. You may feel rejection. You may feel loneliness in your life. You may be abandoned by your family, abandoned by friends, but God will never abandon you. God still loves you. And David says, what I'm going to do Because of the steadfast love of my God, I'm going to sing. I'm going to give praise to my God. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Beeson School of Divinity in Birmingham. They had a pastor's conference there, and and I got to spend a week. It was a refreshing time for me, and I looked at the list of different breakout sessions and things that I could go through during the go to during the day. And as I looked down that list, there was one that stood out to me. The title was The Dark Night of the Soul. <laughs> the Dark Night of the Soul. And at this particular time, I was going through some things in my life, going through some things in my family. I was overwhelmed. I, 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 was, I was so looking forward to getting there because I just felt so barren. If you've never pastored, you don't understand. So, so do me a favor. I'm going to say this for pastor. Don't ever go to pastor and say, hey, I understand. No, you don't. If you've never been a pastor, you don't understand. I was giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving, and I was just, I was just exhausted. And I, 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 was, I was overwhelmed with some decisions in my family. And, and so I saw that dark night of the soul. I said, I'm going to that one. I'm going to that one. And so I'll never forget, never forget this, Pastor. I walked, I walked down the hall, turned left, and started, and I was trying to figure out which room was what, and I noticed that there were just people, just a mob of people out in the hallway. And what I found out is there were a lot of people that wanted to go to the dark night of the soul session. And we got in there, and the whole thing was, of course, about Depression, discouragement, being overwhelmed. But you know what we did? We got in that room together and we began to sing. We began to sing songs. And there was a Christian counselor in that room. And here's what he said to all of us pastors. He said, I'm going to tell you one of the best things you can do to come out of the darkness, to come out of the fog, is to sing your way out of it. Now let me ask you, church. This is a Bible church. I know you know your Bible. What are the Psalms? They're songs. It's a psalter. David is being a songwriter here. He's writing a song about his life in a a dark time. And he's writing praise music. A song about how great his God is. And he says this, God, I'm not really satisfied with my circumstances right now, but I'm satisfied with you in verse number five because God, you are like the rich food that I ate on the table back in Jerusalem. That is so satisfying to my palate. God, you are satisfying to me, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. One of the most difficult times I've had in my life in getting in the fog and getting weighted down in the fog is at night when I lay down on the bed. Don't raise your hand, but I wonder how many of us wake up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning And our mind takes off on us like a hamster wheel. 
and you're thinking about your problems and the things that are weighing you down and the decisions your children are making and the condition of the country and your mind is just like this. David said, God, when I lay down on my bed, I'm going to think about you. I'm going to think about you. I'm going to think about your goodness in my life. Why? Because, God, you've been my help. Let me finish. When you're in the desert, you got to remind yourself that God is our defender. That God is our defender. Notice the phrase David said, as long as I live. Stay with me for just a moment. As long as I live. You know what? David is in a moment in his life where he doesn't know if he's going to live 24 more hours. He doesn't know how much time he's got left. But he says, God, I'm not going to waste the time I have left worrying and being fretful and accusatory. God, I am going to focus on you because here's what I know. God, you have a track record. Verse number seven, you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. The right hand, of course, is a position of authority and protection. Though they are seeking my life to destroy it, God, you have the final answer over my life. Do you believe that today about your life? Do you really believe that? That God has the final word? He's got the final say, so it doesn't matter what man does to you. It's something I've had to learn in ministry as a pastor, because sometimes we want to be vindicated or we want to get the last word. I'm not my defender, God is. Amen? Amen. Let me finish. Some have argued that the last three verses somewhat seem to be thrown in there. I'm not going to unpack all of that. Some say there's a shift and the thought doesn't perfectly fit. But I want to close by simply saying that's not the case. Because David simply comes back to where he began. In this messed up world that he finds himself in, in the desert. He comes back to the importance of clinging to God and knowing that God has the final word. Those who seek my destroy my life, God, you're going to deal with them. They're going to fall by your sword. The animals are going to eat their flesh. Verse number 11, what I'm going to do in the desert is I'm going to rejoice in God. And all who swear by him shall exult. And those who are lying about me, their mouths will be stopped. How many of you believe there's coming a day when there will be no more lies? (laughs) Where the truth teller, the one who said, I am truth, is going to come again. David said, I can't rejoice in my nation. I can't rejoice in the situation of my family. I can't rejoice in the sanctuary. But God, I'm going to rejoice in you. You are my strength. I want to close today by saying, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we know that you're thirsty You're thirsting for something that you've never experienced, but it's a water that you certainly need. John chapter 7 and verse 37 and 38, Jesus said, Out of your heart will flow springs of living water. Springs of living water. I love Isaiah chapter 12 and verse number 3 where Isaiah prophetically says, You will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. Jesus Christ is the only one that can quench your thirst in the desert. So I would say to you today, if you have never acknowledged that you're a sinner, sin is missing the mark, disobeying a holy and righteous God, admit that you're a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not as a way, a good way, or the best way, but the only way. Confess your sin. And confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Come to him today. Christian, I close with this. R.A. Torrey said, Despise not the desert. 
Because this is where God polishes his brightest gems. If you're in the desert, God's with you and he's working on you. May we pray together.